so we're here at Old Wisdom Farm. Um, I was just going to show you how I kind of get my um, einkorn sourdough bread started. Um, I always handle my cultures with clean hands so that I don't contaminate it with um, nasty bacteria. So what I have here is I have a nice big bowl, um, spatula, my little bread paddle, um, a couple measuring devices, and then of course you need your sourdough starter and your um, your flour, your einkorn flour, which I buy from Jovial, and then um, a little bit of salt. So um, I've been feeding this sourdough every day for a little bit, um, so it's kind of big. I'm going to end up using quite a bit of it, but I generally just kind of pull out about half of it. I'm just going to put that in my bowl. So once you have your uh, starter in the bowl, you're going to get one and two thirds of a cup of water. Now this is well water, so I don't have to worry about what's in it, but you want to make sure that you don't have any chlorine or fluoride in your water because that could kill your culture and then it won't rise. So and then we're going to put in our uh, half of a tablespoon of salt and I'm using Himalayan pink salt. Make sure you put it in at the beginning. I have a tendency to forget, and it doesn't taste as good if it's not mixed in really well. And now I have five cups of flour on the recipe, but based on how much starter I use, I may end up using less than that. I just kind of base it on how my bread starts to look as I knead it. So normally, my, I start out with about four cups of the flour and I kind of go from there. Einkorn takes a really long time to absorb water and so you may come back 30 minutes later and your bread's going to look completely different because it took that long for your uh, flour to absorb the water. So it may look really dry to begin with and end up really wet later. Sorry. I have to cut that part out. It may look really wet later on. So I am using my bread paddle here and I'm just, sorry, I'm using my bread paddle here and I am just um, kind of scooping and turning and starting the kneading of this bread to get everything incorporated here and this is the same sort of movement that I'm going to use throughout the process and this bread is looking a lot more wet this time I probably will end up using my full five cups of flour but it, it ends up a little bit different every time just because of, um, of how much starter I end up using. And I do what I can to use up my extra starter, like I'll make tortillas or pancakes, but uh, um, you know, you can still end up with quite a bit that you need to use. And I think just based on how wet this already is, I'm gonna go ahead and put in my fifth cup of flour. Einkorn tends to be very sticky and the gluten in it acts a little bit differently than the gluten in water, modern wheat. Um, so you may find that this bread acts a little bit differently if you're used to handling um, just plain white or whole wheat bread. Um, as I've discussed in my article about this, einkorn is considered the original wheat. It's very ancient, um, dating back to up to 16,000 BC. Um, and they actually found remnants of it in a caveman's stomach 
um, that uh, were also with like some cheese and some fruit, suggest suggesting that maybe he was the first one to invent the sandwich. But either way, it's it's a little bit different and it acts a little differently in the body, which makes it significantly less irritating. So here we are, we've got our, our einkorn is starting to kind of form into a dough. And I'm just gonna kind of knead it until I get a little bit of a ball here. And then I'll leave it for a little bit, like 30 minutes to an hour. And I'll come back and I'll knead it some more. And this kneading does help to form the gluten a little bit. Um, and we do it in the beginning to help kind of show this bread which way we want it to rise once we bake it. Because um, those gluten strands need a little bit of training. If you make the mistake of not kneading, like I did the first time, what you can end up with is a loaf that just kind of explodes everywhere. And it's very ugly. <laughs> Um, but by forming these gluten structures at the very beginning, we get a bread that has a little more shape to it, despite the fact that um, we actually lose a lot of our gluten in the process of fermentation. So I'm going to leave this now. And what I just do is I cover it up with a towel to keep any bugs out. And I'll just leave it. And I'm going to put my bread paddle in water so that I can clean off the extra... Uh, dough and that will make it um, easier to handle this later. This stuff is really really sticky and it will turn into cement if you don't put it right into water. So here we are. It's been a, about an hour um, since we kneaded our bread last and um, we're going to come in and knead it again. You can see that it has uh, risen a little bit. My kitchen is very warm because I've got my oven going. Um, but I just have my bread paddle here and I'm just gonna go right in and just start kneading this bread. And you can see it's a very sticky uh, dough and uh, we might even think about adding a little more flour to this, but we'll kind of see how it acts for us before we make that decision. And I just kind of go in here and I use my bread paddle to scoop underneath and grab a little bit of dough and fold it over to the center. A lot of other videos you'll see um, will do the opposite of that. They'll have their bread on a table and they'll kind of go from the top and tuck it under so that you get a smooth skin over the top, but I, don't, I haven't found that it matters so much. I still get a pretty uniform looking loaf by doing it this way and it's a lot easier because I don't have to take it out of the bowl. And since I am baking this bread um, with a wheat allergy in mind, I do not want to have to add any more flour because as we get further into the process, I want my flour to be fermented. And so um, I try my best to do this process in a way that allows me to not have to add flour to help with the stickiness and keeping it in a bowl and using my bread paddle seems to really help with that. So I think I might add just maybe a quarter of a cup of flour, but I think that's all that I'm gonna add. And then I'm just gonna add a little, and I'll probably knead this for a minute and add a little more. But um, adding flour early on in the process is okay, but as you move forward with the kneading, you, you don't really want to add any more if you're trying to ferment the gluten out of it. So if you did not read my article over this, the reason that I am baking this bread this way is because not only does einkorn have a different kind of gluten in it than our modern hybridized wheat, um, baking it as a sourdough means that I'm able to ferment a lot of the irritating allergens out of it. Sourdough, unlike um, store-bought yeast, contains wild yeast and a bacteria called lactobacillus. 
It's the same bacteria that you use to ferment pickles and the same bacteria that you get when you use raw apple cider vinegar. And woke up, so we're right back here kneading this bread. And what I was saying was that when you ferment the sourdough, we are using the lactobacillus bacteria to um, break down the starches. And once those starches are in the form of simpler sugars, the yeast can digest those. And um, every uh, yeast from different areas is going to be a little bit different. Every sourdough is going to be a little different based on um, where in the world you are. Um, so this this is a San Francisco sourdough. Um, but the lactobacillus and the yeast create a very acidic environment um, which the proteins in the gluten cannot withstand so over time it starts to break down and I usually ferment this for you know around 18 to 20 hours so I'll start it around lunch one day and then bake it the next morning and by that time my bread has had so much time to ferment that it usually smells something like um, yogurt by the time I go to put it in the oven and uh, it is through that process that I'm able to make a bread that is both bread-like, but also um, is, is much easier on my and my children's um, systems because we have a wheat intolerance. So um, this uh, is been the this is the second need. We'll come back here in 30 minutes to an hour and uh, do our third need and by then we can probably just leave this bread alone for a little bit. So I guess we'll see you guys here in just a minute. Okay, so here we are um, back. We're doing our third knead and I'm just gonna start work with my bread here. Um, and I, I like the way that this bread looks and feels. It's sticky but not too sticky and um, it will be just about right for, for making my bread. So I'm just gonna knead this a little bit more and then I'm gonna leave this alone until bedtime and I will transfer it into the vessel that I'm gonna use for baking and uh, let it rise overnight. So I'm just kinda getting it back into a nice little ball here and then I'm just gonna leave it alone. So if you get to your third need and don't like how your bread looks, you can make an adjustment and come back a fourth time. It's just usually by the third time I've got it where I want it. So before I um, end this little segment, I'm gonna feed my sourdough starter here um, because it's pretty hungry. And it was, uh, when I got to it to make my bread, it had a little bit of mooch on top and it uh, smelled um, pretty strong. It smelled like it might have started to run out of food. So I'm going to add um, at least a good cup of flour to it. This will be the end of my bag here. And I'm going to incorporate that, add a little water if I need to. And then um, I'm going to put it in a jar so that I can get it back into the refrigerator. I had pulled it out this last week to feed every day because I felt like it needed a little more time to adjust to the einkorn um, flour. It wasn't a food that this uh, bacteria was used to consuming. And so it's taken, I guess, probably a couple of generations to get it to uh, adjust. So um, now that I'm done with that, I'm gonna um, feed it and let it rise for a couple of hours and I'm going to stick it in the fridge and that'll kind of put it into a hibernation mode um, so that I don't have to feed it more than once a week which is about how often I make bread so I'll pull it out let it warm up to room temperature take what I need and then I will um, feed whatever is left over that I, that I didn't need for my bread So now that this is pretty well incorporated, it does not have to be any particular texture. Um, this is fine, this kind of thick 
oatmeal. Um, I, I'm gonna put it in my jar, which I just put them in a glass mason jar and cover it lightly and then I'll just leave it be. So I will see you guys here in a little bit. We'll be back at bedtime to put our bread into our uh, sauce pot and uh, we'll go from there. So um, this, it's bedtime, so this has sat um, out pretty much all afternoon. Um, and my kitchen was really, really hot so because uh, I was cooking. So I ended up moving it to a cooler room, but it still rose a profound amount in that, um, in that amount of time because of the heat in my kitchen. So it might even be a good idea to shorten this next process just because I can tell that with as hot as it was, it uh, used up a lot of its uh, food. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to just kind of ball it back up so it's a little easier to work with. And I like to use a sauce pot when I'm cooking uh, my bread because I don't have anything fancy or snazzy. I don't have any bread baskets. Um, a sauce pot or a Dutch oven made out of cast iron work extremely well for baking this bread. Um, because I have a lid for this and for the first 30 minutes that this is going to cook um, I put the lid on and that traps the moisture in and then that that helps to produce a good crust and keep your bread moist so I'm just gonna kind of just scoop this into here And I have already put some uh, coconut oil in my pot. And that usually works pretty well to keep it from sticking. You could do, uh, a lot of people use uh, cornmeal to give kind of a classic look to that bread, but coconut oil works just fine. So, and it'll be hard to scrape all of it out because it's a sticky dough. But I'm just gonna come back in, reshape it, and then leave it alone. Now this is the stage at which, depending on how long you want it to proof, you could stick it in the fridge and it would rise a lot more slowly. You'd get a fluffier bread. You can leave it out overnight. You're gonna get a much flatter bread and a much more sour dough. Um, it's all kind of up to you at this point. It's all based on what you're, you want out of your bread. So it doesn't have to be super pretty and just kind of reshaping it here. And I'm just gonna leave it like that. Um, you Normally I leave it out overnight. Um, I'll probably shorten the process a little bit for this loaf of bread just because of how, uh, how much it rose during this afternoon. But either way, we'll see you in the morning. Okay, so here we are next morning. We have, um, our dough in our pot here. It has most likely risen and then fell, so it's not very tall at this point, um, but that's okay, that's what I expected. Um, the next step is going to be cutting some slits in the top. Most people that bake bread all the time have um, razors that they use for this, um, and they're easy to find, but I just, I typically just use a knife. Um, and the reason you do this is it tells the bread kind of which direction to rise. So it kind of guides where it's supposed to go so that it doesn't just go wherever it wants. Um, so then I'll just put my lid on. My oven is heated to 450 degrees. I'm going to um, leave the lid on for the first 30 minutes and then I'll take it off and um, it usually takes 10 to 15 minutes after that, um, sometimes 20, for my bread to be finished. You're gonna look for kind of a golden brown on top. Um, so we'll stick it in the oven and come back here in a little while. So here, here's our bread. It took about 50 minutes for it to bake. Um, the first 30, as I said, had a lid on, so you can see it has a nice hard crust. Um, and uh, I let it cool and then it just popped right out of that pot. So if I were to come in here and just kind of cut it in half, 
it's kind of dense, so it can be a little bit tough to cut. Um, you can see that it's it's not a very fluffy bread at all. It is a very dense bread. And um, it does have a bit of a crumb. I mean, you can see there is a little bit of air in there, but uh, this is what I, I've come to expect when you ferment it as long as I do. Um, let me just give a slice to one of my kids, just a second. <laughs> Yeah, it'll keep her quiet. Um, so uh, this bread is so hearty on its own that we, we tend to uh, kind of let it be a staple of a meal. Like um, we'll have this with just fried eggs and it's a very uh, filling breakfast in the mornings. Um, or we'll have this with fruit and cheese and that'll be a, a meal that we'll eat on a Friday when we're not doing any meat. So anyway, this is uh, my long fermented uh, einkorn sourdough bread and um, I hope that this video helped for you to, to kind of see the process um, since I know sometimes it's hard when you read an article to, to put that into practice um, but uh, if you have any more questions I go into a lot of the science behind this in detail on our website oldwisdomfarm.com so I hope that we get to see you again and we will continue to post videos about how we do things out here.